In today's episode, a young boy playing soccer with his friends on the infamous Komodo Island is attacked while peeing in a bush. The bloodthirsty Komodo dragon viciously shakes the young boy until his body is ripped in half in front of all his friends. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. This is the terrifying Komodo dragon attack on eight-year-old Rudy Safina. Welcome to Final Affliction. It was May of 2007, and Indonesia hadn't had a dry season quite this severe in years. The sun was swelteringly hot, and there was almost no moisture in the air. The locals, who are more acclimated to tropical conditions, were wishing for the wet season to arrive, even if that meant flooding and storms. At least they would finally get some respite from the heat. Of all the islands, Komodo Island was suffering the most. The island is much less urbanized than the rest of the country, allowing for more wildlife to thrive there. This is pivotal to the island's ability to protect the famed Komodo dragon that lives there. There are two other Indonesian islands that also have decent-sized populations of these unique lizards, but none more so than Komodo Island itself. Various bird, oceanic, and reptile species call the island home, but it's the deer and wild boars that are the Komodo dragon's main food source. The Indonesian people are very protective of their unusual and extremely dangerous lizard, not only because they are a rare animal found nowhere else in the world, but also because their tourism industry is utterly reliant on the animal's survival. There are other places that have monitor lizards, but the Komodo dragon, though related to the monitors, is unique. It's the only one in the genus that is venomous, and they are the largest of them all. Even if you manage to survive an attack from one of these beasts, the chances of dying from infection and hemorrhage after the event are almost certain. Most of the very few survivors are those who were lucky enough to have the affected limb amputated within minutes of the initial bite, but most attacks end in death. And yet, despite thousands of these vicious creatures crawling all over the island, the inhabitants of Komodo live quite peacefully among the modern-day dragons. Life just goes on, business is taken care of, and children play without a care in the world. In all fairness to the inhabitants of the island, attacks are incredibly rare. Mostly, they are reserved for the very unfortunate souls that happen to walk right on top of one of these creatures. Any animal will attack if it's cornered, after all, whether you meant to aggravate it or not. But on this day in May, it wasn't a case of an accidental meeting between a human and a predator. This time, the creature was actively hunting. You see, the dry and hot weather was a lean season for the animals in the Philippines. There wasn't as much food growing for the herbivores, so they died or managed to make it to one of the other islands that were close enough. That meant that the only large predator on the island had less to eat than usual. The Komodo dragons were becoming restless and ravenous. Only extreme conditions would have driven the 10-foot monstrosity to heave its 300-pound body into the village to look for food. Right after most of the adults had left for work, the children were out playing. Even as early as it was, it was already hot. In a few hours, it would be so warm that even kids, who never seemed to mind extreme weather when they could be having fun, would seek shelter in their homes. Rudaharto Safina was one of the few older people around that morning, besides the children, and the very oldest that lived in the community. He liked to keep an eye on the kids, since a lot of them were his own nieces and nephews. That's just the kind of values the Philippines are built on. Everyone looks out for everyone. Rudaharto grew up being watched by his relatives, and he was happy to do the same while he serviced his fishing gear in the shade of his front stoop. One of the youngsters out that day was Little Rudaharto, or Young Rudy, as everyone called him. There were so many Rudahartos in the Safina family that people needed a way to distinguish the boy from his uncle and his grandfather, who also shared the same name. Rudy was one of about a dozen children out playing a game of soccer in the street that day. Rudaharto sat down to watch his eight-year-old nephew play, and he had to smile at how little Rudy disregarded all of the rules. 
the little boy thought it was incredibly funny to intentionally annoy his friends by picking up the ball and pretending that he was playing American football instead. Not that the children minded, they were laughing just as hard as Rudy was. It was too hot to take the game too seriously anyway. But just a few meters away from the children, hidden by a clutch of bushes, lay the Komodo dragon that had slunk toward the village early that morning. Dozens of people passed by it, oblivious to the danger that hid beneath the dry foliage. It was perfectly camouflaged. The morning was so busy with people heading to work and the early bustle of daily chores that it had not dared to strike just yet. It was ravenously hungry, but it wasn't stupid. There was no way that it was going to storm into a street bustling with people who would surely kill it on sight if it dared show itself. No, the reptile was going to have to wait for one unlucky human to get separated from the pack. It had been looking for food for two days now, but there were just no deer or boars to be found. Humans were a dangerous prey to target. The animals knew that full well, but desperate times called for desperate measures. All it needed to do was be patient. Surely one of them would come within reach sooner or later, and unfortunately for little Rudy, that moment came all too soon. After an hour of rambunctious play and plenty of water breaks, Rudy had a very full bladder, so he called out to his friends to stop the game and wait for him to get back. He wasn't going to miss out on the fun if he could help it. Rudy ran as fast as he could to the clump of bushes on the other side of the road to relieve himself. The thing that was lying in wait couldn't have asked for a target to come any closer. The skinny boy was running straight at the bushes where it was hidden. Rudy did not even glance at the ground, or he would have run the other way when he saw the dragon that was coiled there. But his eyes were on the game, making sure that his buddies didn't dare go on without him. Poor Rudy hadn't even had the opportunity to undo his pants when the beast sprang at him. As he screamed, his entire body was lifted above the bushes. The lizard hadn't just bitten into him, it took after Rudy at a run. When it closed its jaws around Rudy's thin frame, both the boy and the animal were lifted several feet into the air, propelled by the pure brute force and speed that it hit Rudy with. For a second that seemed to last an eternity, the boys in the dirt street and Ruta Harto stared in horror at the scene that was unfolding before them. Rudy and the dragon sailed through the air, and as they came down from their airborne arch, the creature started shaking its head violently. The moment it tasted blood, it wasn't going to wait until it hit solid ground before it started tearing its prey to shreds. In a shower of blood and limbs, they hit the ground with such a crash that the ground beneath the kids and Rudaharto's feet trembled. That's when Rudaharto sprang into action. The man sprinted toward the bloody scene, picking up the soccer ball as he ran. It was the biggest thing he could get his hands on. He threw it with pinpoint accuracy, but the air light ball merely glanced off the raging lizard's back without the creature even taking notice of it. It was shaking the screaming boy so ferociously that the child's limbs detached from his body as he was flailing so violently. Halfway across the road, he picked up a fist-sized rock and threw that too, and several more rocks flew at the reptile from behind him. Rudaharto's action also brought the young boys out of their stupor, and they threw their own earthen missiles at the animal too. There were dozens of rocks flying through the air, and before the boys threw the second round of rocks, the rest of the few villagers in the vicinity moved in with brooms, empty bottles, and whatever else they could get their hands on. In the shower of blood, pieces of Rudy's flesh, dust, and the thrashing body of the thing that was trying to rip the young boy to pieces, it was impossible to tell what they were hitting. The beast finally felt the strikes, and it released its catch to find the source of the pain. When it looked up, it saw some twenty people moving in on it, mercilessly pelting it with sharp things that broke its skin and left searing wounds. There was no way that it could fight off the horde, so it turned tail and scuttled with a surprising speed toward the deeper bush, taking Rudy's lower half with him. It was gone as quickly as it appeared, leaving a trail of blood in the bone-dry earth behind it. But tiny Rudy was in worse shape. 
The monster had ripped him completely in two. From the waist down, there were nothing but tatters of muscle and entrails. His legs and hips had disappeared into the wilderness with his attacker. It was a miracle that he was still conscious at all. Rudy was beyond screams and words now. He stared wildly at his neighbors as they descended upon him, his breathing shallow and labored. Ruta Harto kneeled beside his nephew. He'd taken off his shirt and was trying to stem the bleeding from the ruined stump that was left of Rudy's body. The men, women, and children started removing their own shirts to help stop the flow. But Ruta Harto had barely placed the fourth piece of fabric around Rudy when the boy shuddered and went still. That mischievous smile would never again grace his face, and all that was left was the ghost of the final moments of terror in his blank, staring eyes. Emergency services came just a few minutes later, though they only came to remove the remains. By that time, the villagers were already in the trees, armed with shovels, picks, and sharpened sticks. They wanted to avenge Rudy and the trauma that his little friends endured, but it was of no use. Among the thousands of Komodo dragons, there was just no way to tell which one attacked Rudy. They looked for one that bore the injuries from the rocks and glass bottles that they threw at it, but to no avail. The beast was gone, and after a week of searching, they had to give up. By that time, most of its wounds would have healed, and it would become entirely impossible to tell it apart from the others. Having tasted human flesh for the first time, it is only a matter of time that it strikes again, bringing another unsuspecting villager like Rudy to there terrifying final affliction.